Pope Francis has captured the imagination of Catholics and non-Catholics alike. But today's guest warns that the very things that make him so popular come with real risks for the church. He's Ross Douthat this week on Story in the Public Square. Hello and welcome to Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Salve Regina University. Alongside me is my friend and co-host, G. Wayne Miller of the Providence Journal. Story in the Public Square is an effort to study, celebrate, and tell stories that matter. To do that, we sit down every week with the best storytellers around, journalists, filmmakers, scholars, and more, to make sense of the big stories facing the United States today. This week, we're joined by Ross Douthat an author and columnist with the New York Times whose new book looks at the impact of Pope Francis on the Catholic Church. Ross, thank you so much for being with us. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. So the, the book is To Change the Church, Pope Francis and the Future of Catholicism. We're going to want to talk about that at length, but I want to start, maybe take a little step back, talk a little bit about you. Uh, uh, Always a dangerous subject. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, you once described your family as, and I'm quoting here, hardline Democrats. Uh, what made them hardline Democrats? I mean, hardline sounds a little pejorative, so I don't want to. I don't want to be too hard on them. Um, but no, I mean, my parents were, I would say, sort of normal, liberal-ish, upper middle class, um, Southern Connecticut people when I was a kid. Uh, my mother was from Maine originally, and my father was from Southern California. Uh, they met at Berkeley in the late 70s, where there were no conservatives, so obviously. Um, I was born in San Francisco, and then they moved back east. And my earliest political memory is of going with my mother at age four to cast a vote for Walter Mondale and Geraldine Ferraro. And my mother was very insistent that she was really voting for Geraldine Ferraro. She didn't really care about Mondale, which put her in a group of about, like, 17 <laughs> people, people <laughs> nationwide. Um, so, so yeah, that was sort of our, our background, and then we ended up, um, for complicated reasons, spending a lot of my childhood on a kind of religious pilgrimage through starting as Episcopalians and going through various charismatic evangelical Pentecostalist churches and then ending up when I was a teenager um, as Catholics. And my, my parents, I would say, are still... Um, Certainly, my my father is still mostly a Democrat, and my mother is, you know, probably leans a little more conservative, mostly because of issues like abortion. Um, but I've never lost completely lost touch with those those liberal Democratic roots. But you are a conservative columnist for the New York Times. Now. So they tell me, yes. Um, the <laughs> the um, and so I'm curious, sort of the, the the evolution from your your sort of you're raised in a in a in a blue household uh, and the evolution that's going on in your faith life does that is, is there a parallel is it that do they happen does your transformation into a more conservative adult occur in line with your religious evolution as well or is it it's that was part coincidental? of it. yeah I, no it wasn't coincidental I mean I, I would say that you know to the extent that I'm a conservative, I'm some kind of religious and social conservative before I'm an economic conservative. And in fact, I think of myself as more of an economic moderate or, or populist even in certain ways, uh, although that's a very loaded term in the Trump era. Uh, but, but yeah, I mean, I think it starts um, to the extent that I sort of moved rightward as a teenager, it probably started with becoming pro-life, which was connected to sort of our our religious pilgrimage and perspectives. And then I think I went a bit further in part in as a kind of rebellion, not not so much against my parents, but you know, I went to a nice liberal secular <laughs> high school where most people were died in the wool Democrats, and then I went to college. Um, at a you know a little school in Cambridge, Massachusetts called Harvard, and where there were also a lot of liberal Democrats, and so it became sort of natural, I think, because I had a certain kind of conservatism rooted in religion to define myself um, against 
you know, you, you have to rebel against something as a kid. So I ended up rebelling a little bit against liberalism. So you got to Harvard, and you were very public with your views. You wrote a conservative column for the Harvard Crimson. <laughs> I did. You did. And you edited a conservative newspaper called the Harvard Salient, which I'd never heard of, but it's a conservative paper. It has a small circulation. Is it still there? Um, I, I believe so. It's like all of these sort of small ideological publications on college campuses. It tends to sort of flicker in and out of existence. Um, so I'm not, I'm not sure of its status this particular academic year. So, but, so what prompted you to be so public in, in the, at that place? I mean, I'm a fellow graduate of Harvard, and I, I think you would agree that it certainly leans toward the, the progressive side of right. things in general. I mean, you I could like have just been a, You could have been a shy, quiet kid with conservative views, but you went in a different direction. Well, I wanted to you. write. Uh, I like to okay, write. Okay, so the writing case. So I, I think it was, and if you're going to write... Um, you know, if you you can do campus journalism in various ways, but I was never much of a reporter. Um, I was never very good at, you know, the essence of the reporter's job is getting someone to tell you something that they're not supposed to tell you, and I never actually figured out how to do that. Uh, I was much better at arguing, and so that was sort of the line of writing and journalism that I that I went down, and that meant that I, you know, if you're going to argue, you have to express my your views, and my views happened to be more conservative, so I ended up expressing conservative views, and that has sort of, I guess, been the story of my entire career since then. But I could imagine a different world where I, you know, a few things had gone differently freshman year, and I'd ended up at the literary magazine and was today writing, uh, you know, works of literary fiction, and nobody knew what my politics or the are. Or the lampoon, and you could be on Saturday Night Live. Right? As that, that <laughs> also, I, I, your I estimation of my sense of humor, I really, I really appreciate it. I'm flattered. So then you, you graduated from Harvard and almost immediately got a job at The Atlantic. I mean, that was fast. I mean, I've read some of your columns, by the way, and they, they were good. I mean, the writing Oh, The Campus? Yeah. The campus column? Yeah, 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 that was probably my best work, to be honest. It's probably been downhill <laughs> since, since then. I, I, I'm not sure I'd agree with that. But, so you went to the Atlantic. Boom, right? Graduate, you go. You were there seven years. What did you do there at the Atlantic? Well, I started out as a, I mean, it wasn't like a, a boom. I started out as like the lowest low-level researcher possible, yeah. uh, working for the owner, actually, um, a man named David Bradley, who had bought the magazine. So we were in Washington, D.C., and at that point, the magazine as a whole was still in um, Boston. So my first couple of years there were just sort of a typical beginning of journalism job, like filling binders with ideas that nobody was going to write about. Um, but I did, I sort of, once the magazine moved to DC, I sort of clawed my way into some actual editorial responsibilities. And then, you know, what you do when you want to be, when you want to be a journalist is, again, you have to write. And so The Atlantic was too distinguished and storied a magazine to let a 23-year-old really start writing for it, even though I worked there. So I did lots and lots of freelance writing. I, Because I thought Harvard was a really interesting journalistic subject, I ended up writing a book about Harvard that uh, a few people read um, that was, you know, very presumptuous in its way. It's, you know, one of those, like, 25-year-old tells you how it is kind of books. Um, this was privilege, Harvard and the education of the ruling class. That's right. That's right. Uh, and some of it isn't embarrassing. Part, some of that, <laughs> some of that part. Um, So I did, yeah, I did that. And then I ended up writing, I, you sort of fall into things too as a writer. So I was in DC in the early 2000s when everyone was writing about foreign policy. It was after 9-11. And Again, I didn't have, I hadn't, I wasn't embedded with the 101st Airborne. I didn't have a lot of foreign expertise. Um, so you sort of look where there is a void. And so a friend and I started writing together about domestic policy, which fewer people were writing about, and even fewer were writing about conservative domestic policy. And we wrote a book about that in the mid 2000s. And so suddenly, I guess I had sort of a career. You know, I'd, I'd written or co written a couple of books. I did a lot of, I did, and, and then at The Atlantic, I started writing for their website. This was sort of the golden age of blogging when everyone had a blog. And so for a while, we had sort of a virtual op-ed page at The Atlantic. Um, so yeah, and then, and then I joined The New York Times. So it was a, a, a sort of... So you caught the blogging wave, but not the podcasting wave, because that's the thing now, right? That's the thing now, yeah. yes. And, and well, I'm... I'm I shouldn't say too much, but internally at the Times, I'm very much in favor of there being an op-ed 
podcast, and I do a kind of I do movie reviews for National Review, sort of on the side, and we have a little movie podcast there. Um, but that hasn't been part of my sort of what you know, whatever. You have some kind of identity, right, as a as a writer. So I was there when everybody had a blog, and well, now blogs have sort of been subsumed either by Twitter or by larger publications. And so now, yeah, the thing is, everyone has a podcast. There's a, there's, a, there's a store in the Public Square podcast, even. You can, you can find it on your favorite stream. Um, uh, <laughs> now, now you, you write in your, in your column for the Times, you write on everything. But your book, uh, To Change the Church, Pope Francis and the Future of Catholicism, is a, it's a, it's a, it's a critique of this papacy. Um, in part. Do you, uh, well, f tell us you, the genesis. Why did you write this book? Well, again, I mean, it sort of starts with looking for interesting topics to write about. And uh, I think most people agree that the Francis Papacy is a fascinating phenomenon. He's a global media sensation. The press loves to cover him. He's, you know, he has sort of um, virality on the Internet, as, as they say. So they're sort of, you start with a famous subject, and then the... I think the inside story of the Francis era, the stuff that people who are more, shall we say, intensely interested in goings on within Catholicism is particularly interesting because it really is the case that Francis has set out to sort of shake free of some of the limits that the church puts on its popes, right? I mean, the papacy is supposed to be this awesomely powerful office. It's, you know, the, 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 it's, he's sort of an absolute monarch over the church. But in fact, the pope is incredibly constrained in what he is supposed to do, right? He's not supposed to change any teachings that his predecessors have, have handed down. He's supposed to be a sort of conveyor of pre-existing doctrine rather than an innovator. And in all kinds of ways, um, right down to stuff just happening this week with his reported off-the-cuff comments um, to, to a gay man who was a victim of sex abuse, um, Francis has tried to sort of figure out ways to get outside that box and to sort of either fight to sort of change particular aspects of church teaching directly or to sort of communicate tacitly, I would say, his his desire for change or reform without sort of explicitly saying, and now the teaching of the Catholic Church is going to change. So, I, I mean, it's, it's a really interesting story. It's the most interesting, I think, religious story of our time, both what he's trying to do and then all the resistance that that has summoned up. And hopefully it's a little more interesting as told by me because I'm skeptical <laughs> of some of the changes, um, which I think yeah, makes me somewhat of a minority in the people covering well, you're an this outlier. papacy. I, mean, I think it, people typically refer to Francis as uh, my favorite pope, right? Mm -hmm. e even people who aren't Catholic refer yep. to him as my favorite pope. Mm -hmm. he's, he's beloved by many people in and out of the one billion plus yes. Catholics on the yes. planet, yes. yes. So you had to take some heat uh, uh, publishing uh, uh, anything that's sort of even... Uh, it's less heat than sort of, I, I'd say, sometimes a friendly bafflement. Sort of why like, would why would you, pope? why, you know, everybody likes this pope. What, what do you have against him? And, you know, and I like many things about this pope. I'm not immune to Francis's charisma or his charms. And I think there are aspects of his papacy um, that are incredibly successful. That sort of, you know, the way that he, I think, uses imagery and gesture and so on to create this kind of public imitation of Christ in a way, these sort of images of him embracing a man with boils and washing feet and so on. You know, some of these are things his predecessors have done as well. He's not, for instance, the first pope to visit a prison or anything like that. But he's very conscious, I think, of the way you can sort of use the office to capture the imagination of the world in a way that is, you know, sort of reflects the best of Christianity. Um, but the push for essentially what amounts, I think, to a kind of truce with post-sexual revolution culture in the West, um, I think is generally a mistake. I think Catholicism's, that, that tension between what the church teaches and the way that we all, you know, myself very much included at times, live now is actually crucial to the Catholic Christian message and that sort of trying to blur it and sort of sand it down um, ends up blurring and sanding down things that are 
essential to the faith and doesn't in the end, I mean, you know, we'll see what happens, but I think it doesn't in the end actually bring people back to church. I think it makes people think better of the church without necessarily returning or taking its truth claim That's seriously. That's the central issue, right? Because the, so I, I'm raised practicing Catholic and the, uh, the numbers of regular churchgoers have plummeted, right? Uh, and so in, uh, here... Uh, depending on where you are. Depending on where you are, right. but in the United States and in most of Western Europe, that's certainly the case. Right. Well, they right. plummeted in Western Europe and they declined steeply in the U.S. in the 60s and 70s and then there was a kind of leveling off partially because of Hispanic immigration and now there's a fall right. again. So, the, so the, I think the defenders of, of uh, Francis would say uh, he's he's seeking this reconciliation with the modern, with the modern, with right. modernity, uh, with the things that have ostracized people from the church, divorce, abortion, because if you don't have a flock, right, then you can't be the shepherd, right? Yep. And so, is there is there you're saying that there's that that's a hollow argument? I'm saying that people have drifted away from the church for a whole tangle of complicated reasons and the stuff related to sex and family and marriage is part of it, right? That there's unquestionably this tension now that didn't exist to the same extent 60 or 70 years ago between what you might call sort of normal middle class morality mm -hmm. and New Testament sexual ethics. And in our world, sort of the message of the New Testament, you know, no to remarriage after divorce, absolute premarital chastity and so on, especially stuff around homosexuality and same-sex marriage, that all seems either like an impossible ideal or sort of actively repressive and cruel. So that, that tension is real. The problem is that if those teachings are literally in the New Testament, right? I mean, you know, the stuff on divorce, which has been the flashpoint of Francis's papacy thus far, goes back. It's not some abstract natural law theory that medieval theologians dreamed up. It's right there. It's Jesus talks about it and people freak out and say, well, who can get married if you can't, you know, if you can't get divorced and so on. So the fact that it's there means that the attempt to just sort of, you know, ease it into the, ease it off stage in order to make the church more appealing hasn't seemed to work. It hasn't worked at all for, you know, all of the Protestant churches, mostly in what we call the Protestant mainline, who've tried it. The, the Episcopal Church in the U.S. is basically where more liberal Catholics have been urging the Catholic mm -hmm. Church to go. And uh, if you think Catholicism's decline has been steep, I invite you to look at the numbers for the Episcopal Church. They're much steeper. Um, so there doesn't seem to be a kind of solution to the problem of sort of Christian church's decline in the modern world just through saying, well, if we just pretend the sex stuff isn't there or isn't that important, people will come back. The divide seems to be much bigger than that. And I, I don't have, you know, I, I'm not here with some obvious agenda for, for how to bridge it either. Um, but I'm skeptical. In certain ways, the best of Francis, right, the things that are most impressive about this papacy is sort of challenging the underlying premises of our sort of technocratic, scientistic, managerial civilization. So if you look at his big encyclical on the environment, it wasn't just saying, you know, we need more action on climate change. It was calling into question the whole way that people in rich societies live and consume and so on. Um, and, you know, when, when I look at the way that we live as it relates to sex and marriage and children, you know, Western societies don't have children anymore. Our birth mm -hmm. rates are staggeringly low. Um, our marriage rates are low. Uh, our out-of-wedlock birth rates are high, even though our overall birth rates are down. And, you know, we're living through the Me Too era, which is, I think, giving us an even wider window into all the ways that relations between the sexes are not necessarily at their best right now. And it just seems like a weird time for Catholicism to abandon its critique of this sexual culture that we've built. It's not clear to me that the sexual culture is actually going to last, mm -hmm. but, but I also could be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> One of the big questions you pose in your book is, will the Pope be hero or heretic? And the story hasn't ended because he's still Pope. But where do you come down on that question? Is he a hero? Is he a heretic? Or is that a black and white division that 
doesn't maybe apply. I mean, that's a deliberately stark way of putting it. Um, but I, I would say that I, I think the Pope is in danger of ending up in the category of popes, and it's a very small category, who mm -hmm. are remembered for sort of some particular f teaching failure, basically, for sort of failing to transmit a key part of Catholic teaching. Um, so I'm closer to the heretic camp, I guess, which is obviously an incredibly fraught and presumptuous thing for a certainly a lay Catholic journalist to say, which is why I try and hedge it around with various modest formulations and also with the point that I could be wrong, right? And it's one thing the book tries to do is imagine sort of, you know, how, do, how would we tell the story of this era in Catholic history if the Pope is right and his critics are wrong? What, you know, what happens to conservative Catholicism in that case. Uh, but I think Francis has sort of set up that kind of high stakes, it's, it's a high stakes gamble, right? There's a reason that popes don't mm. take these kind of risks because either, yeah, either you're remembered for sort of figuring it out, right? Figuring out the reforms that the church needed to sort of make its peace with the modern world and evangelize anew, or you're in this small category of popes who um, you know, essentially risked or ended up breaking the church because they flirted in various ways or sort of, or gave space at the very least for what ends up remembered as heresies. Hmm. Um, that's a big <laughs> conversation. And watch this transition. So let, let's, we've got about five minutes left. We do want to talk about some of your other work with the Times. Um, you are, uh, um, you've been a, you've been a, a critic of uh, President Trump. Uh, in one of your recent columns, you wrote, Trump is a dictator on Twitter, a dear leader in his own mind, but in the real world, there is no Trumpocracy because Trump cannot even rule himself. And while real tragedy may arrive eventually, in this historical cycle, a dismal sort of farce is what comes first. In a nutshell, what's your objection to the Trump presidency? I mean, my, in a nutshell, it's that he's not qualified for, or competent enough to execute the office successfully, and that his presidency, therefore, is a mix of sort of past their sell-by date Republican policies that the Congress has tried to push through um, with a few successes and a lot of failures, um, a lot of sort of sort of Twitter warfare against his enemies, and a certain amount of seedy personal corruption. Um, as that quote you read was trying to suggest, I'm, I don't think Trump is a dictator in the making. I'm not sort of where some of his more ferocious critics are. I think that his presidency is more farcical. And of course, you know, if something goes wrong in North Korea or the Middle East, a farce can turn into a tragedy. Um, but, you know, I, I, think, I think Trump is, I think he was sort of elected as a kind of act of desperation by conservative voters who felt the country slipping away from them. And as a result, he, he doesn't have sort of an agenda, a vision, or any kind of practical path to implementing it. Um, on the other hand, the economy is very strong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, that, and that can cover a multitude of ills. Uh, but I mean, it's, it's a fascinating question, I think, for Republicans and conservatives, and especially people who are like me, social and religious conservatives where, you know, you sort of make this, the, the support for Trump is a kind of gamble, right? And the gamble is that if you win an election, you get a certain number of political victories, judicial appointments above all that you wouldn't have otherwise had, and that that is worth it when balanced against one, you know, the crises that could result from having someone who isn't really competent in charge, or two, a kind of degradation of your own side. Right, where you know, so cons religious conservatives are now supporting a president who pretty obviously, you know, bribed the porn stars that he slept with while his wife had just given birth to the, to their child, and and social conservatives are making the opposite kind of arguments from the ones they made in the Bill Clinton era. And my assumption is that that exacts a cost that's harder to measure than political victories, but that matters more to them. Um, but. Again, I could be wrong. It's sort of, you know, it's Trump hasn't been as bad as I expected. Like, I expected the world to be much more destabilized by his election. I expected the stock market to do worse. And so it's important to sort of 
maintain a certain amount of healthy uncertainty about this totally unique situation in American, <laughs> in American politics, right? You don't have a crystal ball, but... I do not. But let's say you did. How do you see the rest of his presidency unfolding? you got about 40 seconds to look into that crystal ball. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, nothing's going to happen on domestic policy at all, no matter what. Um, the there's, you know, we'll sort of lurch from situation to situation in foreign policy and um, basically you have, what you have to hope is that the rest of the world seeing American power in these unstable hands sort of decides to self-correct on its own and say, all right, we're going to work out regional balances of power rather than people seeing opportunities to, you know, make huge power grabs that are destabilizing. And I think the first one is what's happened We've had more of that, which is more sort of people working out their own arrangements, less destabilization. Um, so I'm, ho I'm hoping that continues. And then, you know, I mean, if the Democrats, if they can't, they couldn't beat him once. If they can't beat him twice, they should probably just disband the party. That's the note we've <laughs> got to leave it on. Yep. Ross Douthat, thank you so much for being with us. The book is To Change the Church, Pope Francis and the Future of Catholicism. It's a provocative read. That's all the time we have this week. But if you want to know more about Story in the Public Square, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter or visit PellCenter.org. For G. Wayne Miller, I'm Jim Lutis asking you to join us again next time for more Story in the Public Square.